Well, I want to welcome you back to the teaching series that we began last week called Identity. And I was thinking about this this week. To try and to cultivate and develop an accurate sense of self, to understand who we are as God has created us, to understand who we are in relationship with him, when you think about it, is a really ambitious undertaking. I want you to turn to your neighbor and with a smile on your face, tell him, you got this. I remember a few years ago, our kids were in high school, and just before I was getting ready to preach one day, we were all kind of sitting on the front row, and one of Emily's friends was sitting beside her, and she leaned down to get my attention. I was kind of looking over my notes. It was the last song before the sermon, and I was getting ready to speak, and she leaned down and got my attention. Mr. Richard, Mr. Richard. I go, what? She goes, you got this. Now, that, that's, a, that's a, a cute sentiment, but I got to tell you something. In the moment, I was really moved by that. I thought, how cool that this high schooler is sitting there thinking about what I'm going through as I'm getting ready to preach to say, you got this. I, I've always kind of just felt like that was a really, really small little lanyap gift from God. You got this. And, and I think that today especially, this is one of those things that we all need to kind of understand. We got this. We are continuing this series, Identity, that we started last weekend. We're going to step away from the narrative of Moses that we're going to use throughout this series. And today we're going to dive into a subject that I think is so ripe for the blessings of God. Now, as we said last week when we kicked off this series, self-awareness requires God-awareness. When we grow in our understanding of God and of ourselves, it's amazing how many other things start to fall into place? Abraham Lincoln once said this. He said, it is difficult to make a man miserable when he feels worthy of himself and claims kindred to the great God who made him. Isn't that a powerful statement? It's really difficult to make someone feel bad when they understand the value that they have in God's economy and they understand a relationship with God. As a matter of fact, I think you can say that what old Abe was saying here is that self-awareness requires God-awareness. And self-awareness affects every single part of our lives. How you view yourself, how I view myself, affects every single part of our lives, every facet of our lives. And, and it's not just that we want to have positive self-esteem, think good thoughts and put you know, positive energy out into the universe. What we're looking for is an accurate sense of self, to understand the truth and the reality of who we are and who God is. The fact is we are all a rich and amazing gumbo. How many of us like gumbo in the room? Let me just see a show of hands. I'm telling you. There, there is something spiritual about a well-built gumbo. Did you know that you don't cook gumbo, you build a gumbo. And you build a gumbo by creating a roux. Roux is when you just sit there and you stir flour and oil for about an hour and you toast it. My, my, my sister-in-law who's from Colorado, she, she's not familiar with this, and she said, so basically you're frying flour? We're like, Yes, but we like to call it building a roux. You're building a roux. You and I are a rich, aromatic gumbo of our identity, of who God has created us to be. Mind, body, spirit, emotions. These are the essential ingredients of our identity as it was conceived, as it was imagined, as it was created by God himself. And one of the ways that God designed us to manifest or to demonstrate our identity is through our sexuality. It's through our sexuality. Human sexuality, just like our identity, just like our soul, is a gift from God. And how we choose to steward that gift is our gift back to him. And I think it's really important as we begin this conversation, this sermon, 
that we just acknowledge right up front that our sexuality is a supremely complicated gift. It, it is a multifaceted gift. How many of you own a diamond or a couple of diamonds? Let me just see a show of hands. Julie, your hand ought to be up. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating to me when you think about a diamond that, that is taken out of the earth, cleaned off, polished, and then cut and carved into this multifaceted thing that refracts light in different ways. The light is the same, no matter what the diamond is, no matter what facets we're talking about. The light comes in, but then it is refracted uniquely in each and every diamond. And, and I think that that idea of multifaceted light refraction is a great way to think about ourselves. You refract the light of God. You reflect the light of God differently than I do. The light is still the light. That doesn't change. But our lives are created. We are designed to reflect, refract this light. And I also think this. We have to make room in the church. We have to make room in the church to allow people the freedom to process this gift of our sexuality especially when there's so much noise and pandemonium in our world around us. So as we make this room as a church, and we're making room for this. This is, this is not the end of the line today. But as we make room for this, not only for this sermon, but I think how we engage in this conversation, we need to remember just a couple of kind of baseline principles. You can call them ground rules if you like. If you don't like the word rules, don't use that term. But just some things to remember as we frame this conversation. Number one, Scripture is our guide. Scripture is our guide. And I'm going to tell you right up front, today there's a lot of Bible in this sermon. We, I got a lot of Bible verses because this subject does not lend itself to soundbite theology. You, you're not going to find somebody who gets three minutes on a talk show and is able to accurately accurately convey the principles that God talks about. Scripture is our guide. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, all Scripture. Say all. all. That's, that's good enthusiasm. I like that. All Scripture is God-breathed, inspired by God, and is useful for teaching, for rebuking and correcting, but also training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here's what that means. We read the world through the prism of the word. We read the world through the prism of God's word. Culture never dictates terms to scripture. The world doesn't change the word. And for the record, as you'll see as we go throughout this message this morning, you'll be amazed at how little things have really changed from when the Bible was actually written. I think cultures change, but people really don't. The cries of the human heart don't change that much. And I think we can take great comfort in the word of God. So we're gonna use scripture as our guide. Look at Colossians chapter four. Colossians four, five, and six says something absolutely fascinating. It says to Christians, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. That's a fascinating word to those of us who are followers of Christ. It, it means that we are to know Scripture, we are to use that as the guide for our lives, but we are to be kind, we are to be gracious in the way that we present it. First Peter says, always, say always. always, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have in Christ. But, and this is a big, big but, but do this with gentleness and respect. So basically, Christians, know the truth, live the truth, and don't be a jerk. Words to live by. Somebody help me preach. So just understand that. Now, at the same time that we're to be respectful and gracious, 
we're not going to change the message of Scripture. And, and it's very important that we understand this. 2 Timothy 4, 3, again, written 2,000 years ago. Look at what the Bible says. The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So know the truth, live the truth, do not be a jerk. So scriptures are guide. Second guideline, be kind. Be kind about it. As a matter of fact, throughout today's message, at some point you may hear something that affirms something you believe deeply and you want to clap or shout amen. I can't believe I'm telling you this. Please don't. Please don't clap or shout amen because I promise you this, you are sitting next to someone who is wrestling with this subject or who loves someone deeply who is wrestling with this subject and I would hate, I mean hate, for them to feel like an applause was somehow a celebration of something they're really struggling with. By the same token, being kind. You may hear something today that makes you want to just walk out of here. You're like, I'm out of here. Three snaps and a Z. Please don't. Please don't walk out. Because I believe that God, in his Holy Spirit and in his grace and truth, God wants to do something so profound to bring clarity to the chaos surrounding this subject, to bring peace to the pandemonium that our world is so hell-bent on stirring up about this. If you're processing this, this is what this is for. I'm not talking about, you know, people who want to drive the agenda. I'm talking about people who need room to process and who are trying to figure out, what do we do with this? I hear all the noise, but, but what do I believe? What do I, how do I live this out? And that's what this is for. So don't clap and don't leave. <laughs> Respectful and gracious doesn't mean that we don't tell the truth. As a matter of fact, truth is a kindness. You're never being kind to somebody to affirm an untruth, to affirm brokenness, to affirm sin. That's not kindness. And so when we speak the truth in love, our posture is truth and grace. John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus, the, the Word made flesh, Jesus himself became flesh. He's the Word made flesh. That means that Jesus Christ perfectly personifies every single passage of Scripture. And it says in that same verse that he came to us from the Father full of grace and truth. So as followers of Christ... Our posture to the world is grace and truth. That's our goal. That, that's that's going to be our posture. So this is, this is my prayer for this message and this ongoing conversation. Number one, that God will use this message to do three things. Clarify. I think that as we go to God's word, as we engage with him and with each other, he brings clarity to the chaos. I'm especially thinking about parents Parents who are trying to figure out, how do I talk to my kids about a subject I don't want to even talk to my wife about? How do, I, how do I make sense of this? They're hearing these things. They're seeing these things. Again, God will clarify these things. And, and I think that's a really, really important thing. The second thing is, I think God is here to encourage every single one of us. That as we look at Christ, rather than culture, as we look at Christ, we will be affirmed in our faith and if we're not yet followers of Christ, we will be drawn to the one who perfectly embodies truth and grace. And so there's encouragement of that. If you're a follower of Christ, remember we, Easter was not that long ago. Remember? Easter. The hope of Easter. The fact is that Jesus has got us. He, he's got us. We're going to tell your neighbor right now like you mean it. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. Remember, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. Guess what? You're the whole world, or at least part of it. So that's an encouragement. But then the third thing, and I always pray this, no matter what the subject, no matter what the sermon, 
is that God will reveal himself to us. That through whatever subject we will see the cross and the empty tomb, we will, we will see God revealing the good news of Jesus Christ in everything that we do. Now, for us to get into this subject, we have to understand that our sexuality is a gift from God. It, it is a gift from God, just like our identity is a gift from God. And, and our identity and our sexuality are absolutely linked, but they're not the same thing. Our sexuality is not the same. It does not define our identity. It, it's not all of who we are. It's a part of it, but it does not define it. It's a clear expression of our mind, body, spirit, emotions, and soul. Go all the way back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. Let's just stop right there for a second. Take that, take the verse down. Take the verse, take that down. God made you. He made me in his image. That's a profound reality of our identity. No other part of creation has that. The Bible says that he has made us just a little lower than the angels. Psalm chapter 8 says, God, who is man that you are mindful of him? Who are we, God, that you would consider us? So he's made us in his image. Now, go back to the verse again. Well done, thank you. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Isn't it amazing that here in the creation poem of Genesis, God establishes this link, this connective tissue between our identity and our sexuality. Male and female, our sex that was assigned, not at birth, our sex is assigned at conception. God had us in mind before he knit us together in our mother's womb. Now there are parts of the character and the nature of God that men carry more than women do. There are parts of God's character that women carry better than men do. And there, there's overlap in that, but male and female are part of the creative genius of God. They're baked into the reality of creation. They are fixed at conception. The second two cells came together to begin making more cells that made you. It was already established that you would be male or female. Now, in some rare, rare situations, there are people who are born with conflicting sex organs, and we have to address that medically. But male and female are not social constructs. Now, let me say this. Social and cultural norms definitely help to shape masculine and feminine. That, that happens all the time, right? But male and female is a God-given essential element of our humanity. Chromosomes just are what they are. Now, we also need to acknowledge this. Gender dysphoria is a real thing. Gender dysphoria is the distress or just stress when there is a disconnect between a person's mindset and psyche and their physical body. It, dysphoria is just the opposite of euphoria. Like if you're, let's say that you're a guy and you're like, man, I'm really happy I'm a guy. I remember when, when Julie gave birth to our kids, I was overwhelmed at the goodness of God and here's life coming into the world and thank God I'm a man. I was so happy about it. That's gender euphoria. But there is gender dysphoria. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you that most people, not some or not a small person, most people experience some form of gender dysphoria, especially during adolescence. We all get uncomfortable in our own skin and our own bodies. Things are happening we're not ready for. That doesn't mean that you're in the wrong body. It just means that you're an adolescent. And I think we have to give students and families room to process that without labeling it something or changing and reassigning things. Gender dysphoria is real, but it's also real that a lot of people, and you don't hear about this as much, but a lot of people have transitioned to a different gender and experienced deep and profound 
depression and anxiety and regret and are trying to retransition back. That happens all the time. So we have to be very, very, very careful in our conversation and in particular in our choices and our actions. A couple of years ago, a good friend of mine who's in ministry but not in church world called me and he said, I've got a question for you. I'm working with a friend of mine who her son has just come out as gay. And she, and her son and she, they're a committed Christian family. And she's being bombarded with people who are telling her on one hand, well, you know, to, to love your son, you need tough love. You can't let him come home for Christmas. You can't let him come over. That's, you can't approve of this in any way, shape, or form. But then there are also those who are saying, you need to celebrate and affirm that and, and, and just recognize that this is who God made them to be. And, and so, Mac, what do I tell her? Well, in 25 words or less, I was, I mean, and so we went through the whole thing, and, and I would suggest to you that there's not a clear-cut, simple answer. If you think that's a simple situation, Christian, you're not paying attention. It's simple until it's your child, until it's your brother, until it's somebody close to you that you love, and now you have to figure out, how do we do this? Again, Scripture is our guide, but we also have to pray for wisdom. We have to ask God to give us discernment in the moment, in the conversation. And, and I think it's very, very important that it's okay to say, I love you, and I disagree with you. I don't think this is your identity. That's not hate speech. That's, that's not mean-spirited, that's not homophobia, that's not transphobia, that's not any of those things that it gets labeled. It's just one person sharing their beliefs with another person who is sharing their beliefs. And so we've got to be able to have those conversations. We've got to be able to, to talk about it. Satan has so brilliantly twisted the gift of our sexuality that God has given us in his grace and his goodness, but he's also dictated, the ter- Satan has dictated the terms of how we talk about it so that it's become a wedge issue that drives defensiveness, divisiveness, and discord. Just by way of statistics, in 2004, you know I love me some statistics every now and then. 2004, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance in Washington, D.C. estimated that 3 to 4% of the American population was LGBTQ. 3 to 4%. In 2021... 21% of folks between 10 and 25 years old identify as LGBTQ or I. Now, how in the world did we get from 3 to 4% to 1 in 5 in the amount of time it takes one generation to graduate high school? I, I think it's fair to say that our world, our culture, has put such a bullhorn on this subject that it appears everybody's doing it. And that's just not the case. I would also suggest to you that probably in 2004, the numbers may have been a little bit higher than 3 to 4 percent. People weren't quite as celebrated back then as they are now. I would also suggest to you that of those 10 to 25-year-olds who are identifying and thinking in those terms right now, a lot of them are not going to stay there. Our, our sexuality is always in development. It is always growing and being cultivated according to the word of God or according to the world. But a lot of, it's, it's, it's become such a cultural phenomenon that a lot of people are like, yeah, that's me. Maybe, but maybe not. You, you may be just figuring some things out on the way. So what does the word of God say? Again, we go back to the book, back to the beginning in Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter two, God has Adam and Eve, the man and the woman in the garden. He has just created Eve for Adam. We know that he's created them both in his image, but they're different, male and female. In Genesis 2, 24, and then echoed again in Ephesians five, the Bible says, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become 
one flesh. The gift of our sexuality was always intended by God to be guarded and celebrated in the cocoon of covenant marriage. One man, one woman, one life. That's what this means. When it says one flesh, it means so much more than just two bodies coming together. I love the way one rabbi put it about the union of husband and wife. He said, we come as close as we will ever get to God himself, turning the prose of biology into the poetry of the human spirit. Isn't that good? When a, when a husband and wife are functioning as God designed them to function in every way, not just in areas of their sexuality, but I think we could all agree that our sexuality is a really powerful expression of our identity. I mean, I would challenge you to find it's, it's, it's powerful. It's more powerful than when you're working out. More powerful than when you're, you know, balancing the checkbook. I hope. I think it's safe to say God intended it to be that way. When you combine the reality of male and female with the reality of God's intention for marriage, you start to understand why sex is so powerful a gift. It is an expression of the nature and the love, the very character of God. And then in the shadow of the cross, after the empty tomb, marriage becomes an expression and a, a vehicle for the gospel itself. Paul says, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother. This is a great mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So the way I love Julie, the way Julie loves me, ultimately, it's great what happens here. That's nice, and hopefully it's a good thing, and it is. But, I mean, ultimately, marriage is a vehicle for the gospel. It's about sharing Christ with people. Now, there is a growing chorus of Christians who affirm different expressions of LGBTQ life. And they'll, use, they'll point to linguistic technicalities and cultural assumptions about the writers of Scripture to dismiss the biblical prohibitions. And I've, I've done the homework. I've read a lot of what they write. But there's one argument that I haven't yet found. There is not one single word of Scripture that endorses an LGBTQ lifestyle. Not one. There are multiple prohibitions against it, but nowhere does Scripture endorse or support any sexual relations outside of marriage between a woman and a man. Romans chapter 1 speaks to this. Paul is writing in Romans 1, and he's describing God's response to people who willingly suppress the truth in order to rationalize their own choices. And this is what he says. Therefore, let me, let me remind you of something real quick. We never use the Bible as a billy club. We, we never use scripture to, you know, but neither do we shy away from what it says. And we have to own this. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Now because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and he received in themselves the due penalty for their error. This is the word of God. Now, let me say this too. Sexual sin in degree is no worse than any other sin. Adultery, homosexual sex, anything in that arena, pornography. That's In degree, that's not worse than robbing a bank or, or killing. It's, it's all sin. But... It does land different 
it hits different in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Pornography, that's a sin against yourself. Pornography may be the ultimate form of cowardice. Pornography just is looking to get without giving anything. Sexual sin is different. I have a really close friend who would tell you that she is a gay Christian. Some of you are like, oh, I don't even like that term. And she said, as a matter of fact, my, my parents have trouble with my saying that, but what I'm saying is, from as far back as I can remember, and she's in her 40s now, but I have always wrestled with same-sex attraction. And she's been very candid with me, and I have her permission to share this story. She's lived a homosexual lifestyle. She has lived with women throughout her life. Not many, but several. But only a few years ago, she decided not to act on those, desi those desires. And she said, Mac, what I've chosen to do is I'm gonna walk in the spirit and not in my flesh. And I thought, what courage to make that choice. What faith to trust God for that. And she says that her desires are a part of who they are, of who she is, but they do not define her. She said, this is my thorn in the flesh. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, so I'm in really good company. And just in case you're not familiar, the Apostle Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians. He said, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness, and therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, we don't know what Paul's thorn was, and I am so glad we don't. So that means we can take this principle and apply it to whatever our thorn might be. For my friend, it's her desire for other women. That's a thorn. For you, it might be the desire to go home and get on your computer and look at pornographic images today. That's a thorn. The good news is that Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Not just sufficient to forgive, but sufficient to empower. Sufficient to live as he has created us to live. And I just want to, real quickly, remind you where we landed last week. Because when it was true last week, it's still true this week. And by the way, it'll be true tomorrow and forever. In God's economy, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I don't know where you are today. I don't know where or how this message lands for you. But I do know this. His grace is sufficient. His grace is ample. No matter what. No matter what. I want to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. This deep water we're wading around in today. But again, I want to remind you the gospel of Jesus Christ never begins with what you do. It never begins with what I do or what I say. The gospel 
begins. It is sustained and it is perpetuated in what Christ has done. In the fact that he took in his body your sin and mine. He took on his body the consequence, the penalty of our sin, and he died. But that wasn't the end of the story. The beginning of the story is he rose from the dead, and the same power that raised him from the dead is available to you. It's available to me. If we will reach out and take it, just receive it. It's a gift. That's why grace is so amazing. If you're hearing these words here in the room or online and you want to take hold of his grace that is sufficient, then we invite you to pray. For the first time, maybe. A prayer of commitment, a prayer of surrender to the only one who will never take advantage of your surrender. In your own words, silently pray something like this. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I need you, and so I confess my sin to you in order to claim and receive your forgiveness. And I will follow you from this moment forward. I give you my life. I surrender all of who I am, every expression of my identity to you. And I ask you to shine your light through me. I pray this prayer in your name. If you would, just remain with your heads bowed for another moment. If that was your prayer, I get to tell you this is the biggest moment of your life. And as a church, we would love to help with the moments that follow. If you would, let us know. Let us know that you made that choice to follow Christ. Use the QR co card. It's in the seat back in front of you. If you're on the front row of a section, it's underneath your seat. And all that does is start a dialogue, a conversation about what's next and how we might be able to help. Also, if that was your prayer, would you just raise your hand quietly but unmistakably? Just raise your hand and hold it up high over your head. Your hand in the air is just a physical statement of the spiritual commitment that you just made. And as a church, as a family of faith with you, we celebrate that. And our family tradition is you go ahead and put your hands down. We're gonna put our hands together and tell you, welcome home. Welcome home.